Well, welcome to this session of statistics and law, this one being about commun the communication of statistical evidence and understanding of probabilistic inference uh, in criminal trials. My name is Colin Aiken, I'm chairman of the Royal Statistical Society Statistics and Law Working Group. So I'm chairing this session but I'm also giving the first talk. The, there's three of us, myself, Paul Roberts, who's Professor of Criminal Jurisprudence at the University of Nottingham, and Graham Jackson of Forensic Science at the University of Aberystwyth in Dundee. Uh, and so I'm going to t the title is uh, about a project the group did to, uh, to produce some reports on, on that title. The first three of those reports are, are, are there's a few copies over there if you want to have a look at them. Uh, the fourth is, is nearing completion. So, to, to start with a bit about statistics and evaluation of evidence, what were a historical review, very quick one. We're, we're look, what we're looking for is a similarity between evidence associated with a crime scene and evidence associated with a, a suspect. Generally, we're thinking uh, primarily about trace evidence, fingerprints, DNA, fragments of glass, gunshot residues and so on. And you find something at a crime scene which you link to the criminal. You find something similar associated with a suspect. And the question is how valuable is this as evidence supporting a proposition that the, the suspect was actually the, the criminal. Uh, there were well, various ways of looking at this historically. To look at relative frequencies, the idea then was if you f something was rare in some background population of innocent people and you found it associated with a suspect and associated with a crime, then it supported the, the prosecution's case. Uh, it gets a bit more sophisticated in things like DNA profiles. It, it may be supportive of the fact that the suspect's DNA was at the crime scene, but then you have to do an awful lot more beyond that as to why was it there and uh, how relevant is it and so on. Uh, but this was just saying something is unlikely if the suspect is innocent, it's not saying anything about what would be the case if the suspect, if, if the suspect were guilty, for example. Uh, discriminating power, a more general aspect, how strong is a particular piece of evidence in general. It would have laboratory experiments, comparisons of items known to come from the same source, comparisons of items known to come from different sources, for example. Uh, comparison, hair comparisons and studies done with hairs known to come from the same person and hairs known to come from different people. You could work out a statistic for comparisons and a large value would indicate the evidence type was good at discriminating between evidential material from different sources. It's not really applicable to particular cases but only uh, in general to show this is a good, good evidence. So, and then significance tests, falling off, what some people have called falling off the cliff, had a two-stage procedure. Uh, we find a significant difference between the crime scene evidence and the suspect evidence, significant in the statistical sense, so whether that's at 5% or 1% or 10%. That would indicate no common source. And therefore, that piece of evidence uh, wasn't relevant for the crime. You could go a bit further and say it was a total exclusion. And if you had an insignificant difference between the crime scene evidence and the suspect, that would be indicative of, of a common source. And you have this cliff at the whatever level of significance you're working at, say 5%. So something that was significant at 5.1% would be indicative of a common source. Something insignificant at 4.9% would suggest no common source and maybe even exclusion. Uh, but then the second stage, if the difference was insignificant, is the similarity between crime scene evidence and suspect evidence. Is it rare or common? 
Uh, so in rare, the evidence would be stronger than if it was a common characteristic. And that, you could understand that intuitively for one piece of evidence, but if you applied this to several pieces of evidence, it's very difficult to actually combine the values of these pieces of evidence. So, what we are working towards is the light comparing two propositions, one put forward by the prosecution, one put forward by the defence, and looking at the likelihood of the evidence if the prosecution proposition were true and the likelihood of the evidence if the defence proposition was true. Uh, it was mentioned in the Dreyfus case, a report by uh, mathematicians Darbu, Appel and Poincaré, saying the evidence is so many times more likely if, X, if the prosecution's case was true than if the defence case was true, but not being able to say anything about whether the actual proposition was true itself. The ideas are used in World War II in Bletchley Park, Jack Good and Alan Turing. And from forensic science uh, in the United Kingdom, it started with Dennis Lindley in 1977 in a paper in Biometrica uh, looking at refractive index of glass as a sort of motivating example. Uh, this is the quote from the Dreyfus case. The impossibility of knowing the prior probability, that is that Dreyfus was the forger, we cannot say that agreement, or Dre Dreyfus was the author of the document, agreement proves that the odds of it being a forgery have this or that value. We can only say that by observing the agreement, the odds become this much larger than before the observation. So, uh, the likelihood ratio, Roberto mentioned it, if you were at the talk earlier this morning, I've actually missed out what he called the most important part of the whole thing, uh, the background information, I. Uh, but there we have the prior odds for the prosecution's proposition, HP, the posterior odds over here, and the factor that converts the prior odds to the posterior odds is this, the likelihood ratio. Uh, if you're looking at evidence in the form of measurements, and uh, this X would be measurements on a control source which, which you know, and Y, the recovered source where you don't know where it comes from, uh, you can show well, one way of looking at it is the denominator is just the marginal probabilities or density function for the recovered data and the numerator is a predictive density for the recovered data given the control data. So this, these could be refractive index measurements for glass. This would be a marginal distribution across some population of windows. This would be a predictive distribution predictive with the uh, what you find at the scene of the crime on the control of the broken window and these are measurements on fragments of glass found in a suspect uh, and just to show how the likelihood ratio works in practice this the, the black curve or refractive index values in general population this red curve would be the uh, density function for refractive index measurements on a particular window, say. Uh, and the actual measurements you find in the suspect are here, and the, at this point it's at the maximum of the, the, the control window. And what the likelihood ratio does is compare the relative heights of the likelihood functions. So this height here in the general population relative to that height in the control window. So that height there is many times the height there, so the likelihood ratio is a lot greater than, than one. So there's no, no significance probabilities. We're not interested in tail area probabilities. We're just interested in how many times more likely if the control the prosecution proposition is true that if the prosecution's proposition is true than if the defence is true. And I get the evidence which is a bit further away from the, the most likely result here 
the likelihood ratio decreases. Over here, the likelihood ratio is neutral. It's equal to 1. And over here, you've got evidence that support, doesn't support the prosecutions at all. It's more likely if the defence proposition is true. Uh, and here's the case, the Dennis Adams case from nearly 20 years ago. Again, this was mentioned this morning. Uh, probabilistic reasoning trespasses in an area are peculiarly and exclusively within the province of the jury. You can't introduce Bayes' theorem because it plunges the jury into inappropriate and unnecessary realms of theory and complexity. And if juries to evaluate evidence by the joint application of their individual common sense and knowledge of the world to the evidence before them. And then, if you're lacking in cases such as this, expert evidence should not be admitted to induce juries to attach mathematical values to probabilities arising from non scientific evidence. So this is a bit of a setback. Uh, and following the Sally Clark case, a couple of years later, the where a very low probability for two sudden infant deaths was, had a, well, may well have had a very large effect on the outcome of the trial. Uh, the Royal Statistical Society set up a statistics, uh, the working group. Uh, the remit of that was to improve understanding of the use of statistics in the administration of justice, discussion within the statistical community, discussion within the forensic science and forensic medicine community, research and development and report appropriately. So we've, we've written some reports and that's what Paul and Graham are going to say more about these. The membership of the group, statisticians, academic lawyers, forensic scientists and representatives of the judiciary, the Scottish Bar, the English Bar. So there's the reports. The first one is sort of about the fundamentals of probability and statistical evidence. And then one uh, which, in which Roberto and Sue Pope helped a lot assessing the probative value of DNA evidence. Uh, one that started off life as to be, being about Bayesian networks. And we were told that we, uh, we can't really start with Bayesian networks. We've got an awful lot to do before that. So it, it's now finishes with Bayesian networks. Logic of forensic proof, inferential reasoning, and criminal evidence and forensic science. And the last one, which is nearing completion on case assessment and interpretation. Uh, you can get them through the website. If you get to the front page of org.uk, I think it's under the policy tab, but it's quite far down. If you just type in stats and law, you'll get straight there. Right. What we're trying to do with the reports uh, for lawyers is to understand enough to be able to question the use made of statistics and probability and to probe the strengths and expose the weaknesses in the evidence presented to the court. That's the law. That's for, for judges it's to understand enough to direct the jurors on the statistical probabilistic and then for the expert witnesses to satisfy themselves the content and quality of their evidence is commensurate with professional status duty to the court. So we're actually trying to do rather a lot of things. We're trying to write for lawyers, judges and expert witnesses. So they've taken rather a long time to write and they're certainly a lot, I think, a lot longer than we originally expected. So how do, interpretation is it legally admissible? That's something for the judge and, this, what, and what, how valuable is it? And that's the question for the jury. Uh, going a bit too quickly. Yep. So admissibility, basically, is it relevant and is it not excluded? The, the US Federal Rules of Evidence have comment that evidence is relevant if there's any tendency to make a fact more or less probable. So well, they're mentioning probability than it would be without the evidence, and is it uh, of consequence to determining the action? So you're, there's nothing, there's no middle ground. The evidence is either relevant or it's irrelevant. Uh, how do you assess probative value? 
How does it combine with other evidence to support or undermine the prosecution, prosecution's allegations or the accused counterclaims? Uh, so the value is a matter of degree. It's measured by a likelihood ratio or sometimes functional, a logarithm. It's the weight of the evidence and you can think of the logarithm as adding weight to the scales of justice. The posterior odds for one piece of evidence become the prior odds for the next piece of evidence and so on. So the, the problems of significance probabilities in combining evidence uh, don't don't occur with this as a likelihood ratio, you can combine pieces of evidence uh, in a very intuitively sensible way. Um, the comments about Bayesianism, what is it? It could be just Bayes' theorem, uh, something like a school of statistical inference, or going a bit further, a conceptual framework for understanding aspects of scientific inference. Problems we've got, well, base rates, what, we're trying to work out what's the background population. We've got a likelihood ratio, we're assessing how rare or common the evidence is relative to what, uh, so the background population. With DNA profiling, is it Caucasian, Hispanic, uh, Afro-American or what? How do we assess rarity? Uh, and then the difficulties. How is the juror meant to process all the possible combinations of pro propositions and evidence that are possible? So this is the sort of thing. What is the probative value of finding a match? And we're not quite sure what a match actually could mean. Uh, clothing on a suspect, glass fragments from a crime scene. And then we're told the matching fragments represent... 7% of reference glass exhibits examined in this laboratory over the last five. So we can say these things, it's, but it's, sometimes it's a bit difficult to work out exactly what it means. Uh, and just to finish, David Kay, a very eminent scholar in this field, wrote some time ago now that new evidence, this is the idea of the likelihood ratio, are fishing in deep waters. Something is flopping about in their nets. The catch is yet to be cleaned, prepared and served as a dish that a true bula bait. So, I thought, that's my bit. I thought, pass it. It's Paul. No? It's Paul. Did you want to type any questions or anything like that? Or yeah, I've no. no, I've got one, one, one question. Yeah, hello. Uh, a basic problem, perhaps, is what is beyond reasonable doubt? So you need to shout uh, up a bit. What is beyond reasonable doubt? <laughs> yeah, well... To, uh, to trial, isn't it? Well, I wasn't... Right. You can... If you look at the... odds for a Bayes theorem, and you've got the posterior odds and your prior odds, and then the posterior odds of what you're looking at for finding somebody guilty or not and then you would have to say well what odds it's a, it's a subjective matter but what value of odds would I take as being beyond reasonable doubt is a 10, 10 to 1 that suggests 1 in 11 people you find guilty or innocent which I don't fancy 100 to 1, 1000 to 1 but it's a, that's a personal matter right well let me know Oh, Can you wait for the microphone? Oh, uh, there was a judge in Brooklyn a number of years ago, uh, Judge Weinstein, who was an evidence professor before. Yeah. And he took a poll of the judges, at least in that, that jurisdiction, the federal judges. And what was interesting, and it was a very good question, is that the judges themselves gave different probabilities. Yeah, oh yeah. They, they went from 80 to 90, to like 95, 98. Yeah. They were, but for, but for uh, civil cases where it's preponderance of evidence, they all gave 50 or 50 plus or 51. Yeah. It was much, uh, much uh, uncertainty in what reasonable doubt means. They were happier with balance of probability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. Right, I think we should.